Welcome everyone. We're so excited to be here once again with you. If this is your first time joining us in the living room session, thank you for being here. Welcome and everybody else, welcome back. Please let us know where you're coming from in the chat. I'm Cecilia Echeverry, Operations and Outreach Director at Christina T. Miller Sustainable Jewelry Consulting. We provide strategy, guidance, and education on responsible sourcing and sustainability for the jewelry industry. If you'd like to find out more, you can check out our website, christinatmiller.com. So the living room is an informal hangout to support community and connection on issues related to responsible sourcing in jewelry. We cover different topics every month and we love to hear from everyone. You can feel free to share feedback and topics you'd like to discuss with this form on our website. They're dropping it in the chat right this second. Thank you again to everyone who showed up to have this conversation today and thank to those that have contributed with the pay what you want option. We are so happy to be able to provide this space mm -hmm. and we're very appreciative of you guys making this possible. So truly thank you. Before we proceed a bit of housekeeping, we are recording as Christina just said, these videos, videos will be in the public realm. You're welcome to speak up, ask questions, put them in the chat. But when you're not speaking, please stay muted to uh, have better hearing for everybody. If you're private messaging, keep it kind. The private chat should be respectful of participants' privacy and personal space. If you want to ask a question or have a comment you wanna share, put it in the chat. And don't forget to subscribe to our email list to stay up to date. The link will be in the chat as well. And our next living room session, just so you guys say the date right away, it's February the 18th. And now let's hand it over to Christina. So we begin, thank you. Woohoo, happy new year. <laughs> We're super excited. Um, 2022 has gotten off to a rough start for um, the majority of the world, I would say. Um, that's why we continue to say Happy New Year. We're pretending that we'll wake up one day and it will be uh, something that actually feels like a fresh start. Um, but here we are. And so we are super excited today to have uh, this incredible opportunity to work with Sherry Torres um, during this living room session. And it's going to be uh, an excellent. Um, precursor or preparatory um, event for anyone traveling to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show um, and applicable throughout your upcoming conversations um, with suppliers, maybe with friends, maybe even with family, right? There might be useful tools in this. So I wanted to share that um, I had the good fortune of meeting Sherry um, in 2015. Uh, because Sherry and at the time her colleague Mike uh, were hired by the Jewelry Industry Summit to help build an engaging conversation um, for all the diverse sectors that make up the jewelry industry. And uh, it was a beautiful event because all of these members of the industry who make up the community and don't necessarily talk to each other on a regular basis may have had biases around certain people um, that were joining, may have had preconceptions. The way Sherry and Mike ran the session, it allowed all of us to relax into the process. And so we were really excited to have um, Sherry join us and work up something that we could do together in this capacity um, in the living room session. So um, we've added her bio to the chat and she's gonna be doing a little bit of explaining about the um, research um, experiences that she has, is drawing from, um, which are, which will be written there that you can read. And um, she's gonna walk us through the process. So um, let's sink in. I'm going to hand it over to Sherry and always, you know, share your comments, questions in the chat, and we'll make note and keep things rolling. Okay. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you, Christina. It's such a pleasure to be here and to see you again um, and to meet the rest of your team. <clears throat> 
Um, since 2015, um, we've taken what is a whole system engagement process that we used with the jewelry industry. Um, and my co-author and I have really boiled it down into two simple practices that support anyone having conversations worth having anytime, anywhere. And so we're going to focus on having conversations worth having about sustainable sourcing. Um, the flow for this session, we're going to talk just a little bit, give you some background about why conversation is so important to focus in on and how much power it gives you when you are intentional with your conversations. Then we're gonna learn two simple practices and then the rest of the time, we're gonna be doing practical application on scenarios and examples of the kinds of conversations that you might be facing coming up. So if you would in the chat, um, Type in what percentage of your waking life you think you spend in conversation, including on email or with yourself. So what percentage of your time is spent in conversation with yourself, on email, and with others? 190, 90, 99, yes. 95, yeah, um, these are, this fits with the kind of numbers we get on a regular basis, is that we're almost always in conversation, usually at an unconscious level. We're, we're talking, but we're not conscious that we are in this nonstop conversation. It's a little like the water in which fish swim. It's omnipresent. Um, it helps us carry on our daily life, but we're not really aware of it. And just like the water, if the water is toxic, fish don't thrive. And if our conversations are toxic in any way, we don't thrive and we can't, we can't live the lives we're really hoping and wanting to live. So the real bottom line question is, what kind of conversations am I having? Am I having conversations that move me and others in the direction we wanna to move towards. Um, and we determined that um, conversations really take place along two axes. The first one runs from appreciative to depreciative. And by appreciative, we mean conversations that add value or value what is. And by depreciative, they devalue a situation or the people. The other continuum is either from statements or asking questions. So we're always in um, conversations that fall within one of these four areas. When we have conversations that are statement-based and depreciative, for example, if someone says to you, customers don't care about sustainability, we call that a destructive conversation. It doesn't add any value and it basically stops any forward motion um, and sometimes is harmful to individuals or groups of people. A critical conversation is one that is depreciative, but it's a question like, oh, is that the new trend now? Or why do you keep coming here? You know, I don't buy anything from you. We call those critical conversations. There's a question, but behind the question is a judgment or an agenda. So it's not really a genuine question. We call these conversations, conversations below the line. And I want you now to recall a conversation that you've been in that was below the line. It was either destructive or critical or even a blend of both of those. So just recall one that you've been in recently. And then notice how it feels in your body. And then in chat, type in, what do you notice? What do you notice happens in your body when you are in a below the line conversation? Tension, yeah, muscles tense up. Stress, that's a heaviness. Kind of heat, tension, yeah, temperature rises, clenched teeth, oh, the emotions come up, guilt, somebody might feel anger. Um, probably if I could see all of your faces, there would be an expression right, of pissed off, frustration, anxiety, fear, 
all of that. And, and it was instantaneous. The moment you were back in that conversation, up it popped. Now, here's why conversations are so important. Because those conversations actually trigger physiological states. And what you just described is exactly what they trigger. They trigger the, the reptilian brain. If you'll take your hands and put them behind your head, like right at the base of your head, you'll notice your thumbs are pointing down. You're in a conversation below the line. And when you're below the line, you're triggering a stress response um, that can be fight or flight, freeze or appease. And it's really there to protect you. Um, unfortunately, that part of the brain doesn't know the difference between a threat to your ego and a saber-toothed tiger. It responds exactly the same way. And it's all about me. So your field of vision narrows. And quite literally, the hormones that are released, the um, cortisol, testosterone, uh, norepinephrine, they actually... Um, inhibit your access to the prefrontal lobe and the neocortex, which is where all your higher order thinking goes on. It's where the executive function is. So just when you might need it most, you don't have access to creativity. You don't have, oh, I'm so sorry, I turned it off. Um, <clears throat> you don't have access to creativity or the ability to connect with other people. So those conversations are not helpful, especially if we're not running away from saber-toothed tigers. Above the line are two different kinds of conversations. One is statement-based and appreciative. So it add, adds value and it's statement-based. The first one like that is paying a compliment or acknowledging somebody. You clearly put a lot of work into this. Thanks for giving me these resources, finding people that can support me. The second one is actually advocating for something. I think there are ways to be sustainable and profitable. So you're advocating, it's a statement, but it's adding value. We call these affirmative conversations. They only go so far because without inquiry, you don't end up moving the conversation forward or inviting another person in. Um, and inviting another person in makes your conversations much more relational. So a question like, what would have to change for us to be accountable? And these are where conversations was worth having reside. And again, these conversations we call above the line conversations. So if you would now recall an above the line conversation that you've been in, either an affirmative conversation or a conversation worth having. And now notice how this feels in your body. What do you notice? Smiling, yes, energized. Creative, clear-minded, appreciative, a sense of validation, feeling confident, um, empowering, connection, connective, yes. And all of those, all of that happened again, instantaneously. The moment you are recalling that situation, those words impact your neurophysiology just the way the other conversation did. It throws you into a place of connection. And this has a whole different set of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are oxytocin. These are all the feel good ones, endorphins, um, dopamine. They, when they flood the brain, you have access to your full brain capacity. So your full potential is there to think clearly, as some of you mentioned, to um, connect with other people, to be creative. Um, oh, I love that comment, Bob, that many below the line conversations become above the line, and that is the best feeling. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about is how can you use two simple practices to actually make that happen. Um, and when you're in that place above the line, you naturally think more in terms of we instead of me. So it's a much more relational place to come from. I'm going to just one more quick video to give you a sense of this above and below the line and what's going on. One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? 
To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money or time or space or energy or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question. We are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat. And when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern-day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. So when you anticipate talking with suppliers about sustainability or asking them um, for sustainable gems or um, supplies for your, your business, ask yourself, where am I? What images come to mind? What kind of conversation is likely to occur? And how does it feel in my body as I anticipate these conversations? Whatever you're anticipating, the, the brain actually puts you in a state as if that's the reality. Um, and so being aware that what I'm anticipating is actually something I'm going to begin to bring about can invite you to change that situation. So if you think about our conversations as being above the surface, like an iceberg, and below unconscious drivers, what we're anticipating is one of them, our beliefs, any kind of stress that's going on, our worldview, assumptions, all of these things are below our consciousness more normally, and they're driving our conversation. And the idea is if we can become conscious so that we can be intentional in our conversations, we can actually create um, conversations worth having, above the line conversations, um, just as Bob said, even in a, in a situation that starts out negatively. Just a quick practice. Um, that we recommend to be able to do that. When you notice 
that you're below the line. And if you, if you put your thumbs at the front of your, or your hands at the front of your head, your thumbs are up. How do I bring myself into the front um, so I can be above the line? And we suggest tuning in. And the first step is to pause. And what pausing does is it interrupts your pattern of anticipating. So as soon as you become aware, ah, I'm anticipating something negative or below the line, pause. That interrupts um, the flow of those negative stress hormones. The second thing is to then breathe. When you take a deep breath, it's a further interruption and taking deep breaths actually triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, which counters that stress response. So all those negative hormones are interrupted. And as you breathe, you begin to replace it with some of the more um, happiness hormones like an endorphins or um, oxytocin. And then the third step is to get curious. Curiosity is a positive emotion. And when you are in a place of a positive emotion, you have access to the prefrontal lobe, to the executive functions in the brain. And you can get curious with questions like these. What, what assumptions am I making? I wonder what comments or questions I, I might ask that will actually send suppliers below the line. How can I not do that? How might I inspire them to be more concerned and care? How might I be a key influencer? If I can't get the product I'm looking for, can I be a change agent for sustainability and responsible sourcing? So it's shifting your perspective. So now I'm going to, get, going to give you the two practices that you can use to change your conversations. The first one is generative questions. And generative questions widen the screen. Literally, when we, when we get in that place of curiosity and when we breathe deeply, our field of vision, neurophysiologically, our field of vision widens. So we take in more of the world, we can take in more of the people around us. And when we ask generative questions, it changes the way we think and it changes the way other people think, stimulating compelling images that we can act into. And here's another quick video. Um, this is specifically about narrowing the, the, um, the screen on, um, on race, but it's the same concept about how generative questions can widen the screen. yourself why these are the black stories we've been shown a narrow view that limits our understanding Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. Oops. <clears throat> ah, next slide. 
So widening the screen so we can widen our view um, around in, engaging with suppliers or anyone is how do we stop those assumptions, the, the stories we tell ourselves or the stories we've been told and generative questions widen the screen by making the invisible visible, asking questions like, um, what am I assuming? Or what's your viewpoint on this? Um, creating shared understanding. What would you like to have happen? What might make this possible for you? Generating new knowledge, questions that um, as you engage back and forth, um, I, asking questions like, I wonder how um, I wonder how the other, that other buyer is, or that other supplier is able to find these. Why don't we find out? Um, or inspiring possibilities. What could we do? What might we do? What if? And those kinds of questions widen the screen and create connection um, between people. Generative questions can shift the conversation. Again, Bob, this is right specifically um, to what you had mentioned, entering into a negative conversation and simply by asking a generative question, what does each of us want here? What could be done? What's one small action? A generative question can, question can shift that conversation and put it above the line in a heartbeat. The second practice is positive framing. And that is simply talking about what you want instead of what you don't want. So what do we want for our relationship, for my business, for your business, for the sector, or for the industry? Um, if you can't um, get a particular product from a particular supplier, doesn't necessarily mean that's where the conversation has to stop. You might end up deciding, okay, the supplier doesn't have what I'm looking for, and maybe I could be a change agent here. What kind of conversation, what positive frame could I bring to the conversation that might eventually bring this supplier around to the, so that the next time I'm in Tucson, this supplier actually has what I'm looking for. One of the first ways that starts with imagining the different conversation. What is the conversation that I wanna have? What if I get into a conversation um, and the supplier at, in the beginning doesn't have what I want, isn't interested in what I want. But by the end of the conversation, I understand more about the supplier. The, understa the supplier understands more about me. And it seems like maybe there's been a little bit of a shift and an interest um, from the supplier in learning a little bit more. What images come to mind when you imagine that scenario? And where are you? Are you both above the line or below the line? The tool that we use from our book is called flipping. Um, and if you have the opportunity to think about how, what kind of conversations do I want to be in? Um, or what am I anticipating? And how can I flip that to something else? Um, <clears throat> then you can foster a conversation worth having. Um, flipping is simply first name, name the problem. What is it that I don't want to have happen? What's the issue? And then flip it to its positive opposite. And then don't stop there. Um, from the positive opposite, ask yourself, if the positive opposite were true, then what would be the outcome? Or simply, what's my desired outcome from this conversation? And let's Let's do, use an example. Um, the challenge is my suppliers don't care about responsible sourcing or sustainability. And the first thing to do here is to tune in so that you can you know, check in on, okay, I'm, I'm anticipating a negative conversation. Let me flip that. My suppliers care about responsible sourcing and sustainability. And these conversations are very transactional. You either have what I want or you don't, and then I walk away. But instead, move it a little bit further. What conversation do I really want to be in, especially if my supplier doesn't seem to care about responsible sourcing? Maybe I might come with a positive frame that says, 
we start to understand one another's perspectives and maybe begin imagining a win-win. That is much more of a relational conversation. Um, now I can be in conversation with the person forming a relationship that may actually influence um, future actions. And then this is where you blend the practices together. When you have a positive frame, then you ask the generative questions. So um, imagine you're, you decide your positive frame is going to be, we understand one another's perspective, and we begin to imagine win-win. Now, what questions might you ask to widen the screen first make the invisible visible and create shared understanding. So in the chat, type in what questions might you ask a supplier around understanding each other's perspective and beginning to move towards a win-win? What kind of questions might make the invisible visible and create shared understanding? And some of these may seem so simple that you're like, oh, maybe that's not what she's talking about. For example, I'm making the invisible visible might, might be just asking the supplier, um, what do you care about? That's a, um, uh, that's a great question, especially if it comes from a place of genuine curiosity. You know, when it comes to sustainability and responsibility, where are you? you know, what's your position on that? And tell me more about that. How did you get into this industry? That's a great question to start moving. It's creating, beginning to build that relationship. Does this seem impossible or naive to you? Does sourcing differently seem prohibitively expensive? Are you looking for more clients for a broader client base? Great questions, Christina. Um, what are your barriers um, when sourcing responsibly? That's a really great question. What are you doing already that makes you responsible? What an affirming question that is. Really bring somebody above the line. What factors do you use to select gems you sell? Do you go back to the same communities or, or suppliers and why? These are all great conversations that help make the invisible visible. I see you care about your sources by wanting to protect them and the sites they work in. I care about this too. My wanting to know more about the site is because I care about the miners. What else can you tell me about their daily life? What a great question. And it elicits a story. When you say responsible or ethical or fair, what does that mean to you? How can I help you begin sourcing responsibly? These are all great questions. And now instead of being in a conversation about your being able to get your needs met right this minute, you're seeding the possibility of getting your needs met in the future um, and creating real positive change. Um, and that generating new knowledge and inspiring possibilities, those questions, the, the one Bob that you asked, how can I begin sourcing I can, how can I help you begin sourcing responsibly? That's one about inspiring possibilities. What can I do? It's about taking and, and moving forward. So once you have that kind of relationship, a sense of shared understanding, um, and don't be afraid to ask the question, are you interested in where I am on this and how I got there? So that the other person um, develops a sense of understanding about where you're coming from as well. Um, that that forms this kind of a solid relationship so that when you ask a question like, how can I help you begin sourcing responsibly or how can I grow your capacity for responsible sourcing? Um, the person that you're talking to knows this is coming from a place of relationship and trust. So let's try another one. Suppliers don't have breakout or antique diamonds to sell me. It's all I buy, but they keep trying to sell me other diamonds. Again, tune in, recognize that this potentially puts you below the line and get curious. So the positive opposite 
is simply the positive opposite. Suppliers do have breakout or antique diamonds to sell me. What might be a frame? If you'll type into the chat, what's a frame for, I mean, this is clearly a supplier that doesn't have anything um, to offer you. So the transactional conversation is kind of done. What kind of a frame could you use to build a relational conversation with this supplier um, that might, might move you towards being able to find more breakout or antique diamonds? What might be the frame you use? What's the outcome you're looking for? If suppliers do have breakout diamonds, what's the outcome of that? If you have a breakout in the future, I would be super interested in seeing, seeing them. Please reach out again. Yes, that's a, and that's, that again is, that's a transactional response back to the supplier. It says, if you have these in the future, then come on back to me. Who can we talk to so you get new sources? That's, a, again, a question. Your frame, so the Cecilia, when you say, who can we talk to, what, what that sounds like to me is that your frame is, I have new sources for breakout or antique diamonds to sell. So finding new sources for these. You want, there's a frame, your frame is never a question. The frame gives you the, the context for asking all your questions. So if the frame is I'm finding new sources, then Cecilia, your question is spot on for that. Who can we talk to? And the supplier might know somebody. So again, here are the, what are the questions we can ask to build this relationship? Um, are you interested in moving into this space? That helps make the invisible visible. If I were able to purchase regularly, would you be open to sourcing more of what I'm looking for? Great question. I'd love to help you um, in finding the right players in that place or space. Um, how do you choose your current sources? These are all great questions, for, again, for making the invisible visible um, and inspiring possibilities. So let's try another one. I don't trust sellers who say, you can trust me, I'm reputable. You can't trust what suppliers tell you. Again, tune in and then flip it. I do trust sell sellers, you can trust me, I'm reputable. And that's not true right now. <laughs> that's what you'd like. If that were true, what might be the outcome? What's the frame? What's the thing that you want? What's the conversation you could be in that would build a relationship that might move towards trusting relationships between you and suppliers or suppliers and miners? Again, it's, if, you, if a question pops into your, um, into your mind about the frame, change it from a question into, oh, that's what I wanna talk about. Just like the, um, how can I get more is the question. Ah, the frame is, I have more. Um, what's a possible frame? Mutual trust and understanding in our working relationships, great frame. Yes. We're creating strategies to build these reliable and trusting relationships. Um, I want mutual um, understanding. How do we get there? How do we build strategies around that? Um, so again, the, um, the do you have photos that you can share with me? Maybe a conversation in around the um, more, more of the transactional uh, conversation. Um, whoops. Um, if the frame is we're creating strategies to build reliable and trusting relationships, that, that um, question about photos is, um, can you supply photos um, that will help us build a sense of trust? Um, Again, Brandy Nice, thank you for sharing. In my work, however, I prefer a more formalized system in vetting my suppliers. 
would you mind sharing some more information, some perhaps some evidenti evidentiary paperwork? Um, and if you don't have it, um, are you open to that? And if so, I have several resources that I can, I can provide you with. Um, my goal is to offer my clients proof and verification. Will that be something you can help me provide? These are great questions. And if not, are you interested? Are you open to that? How do you measure your sources when it comes to responsible sources? I would love to know more and be able to provide my clients with as much assurance as we can. Yeah, so now instead of being in a conversation where the supplier feels attacked, you're in this conversation where you're working together to build that more reliable and trusting relationship grounded in the fact that you've made it really clear that you need more evidentiary um, data behind your purchases. Uh, let's do, oh, you've already done that. Um, what kinds of challenges do you face when getting information about the stone you offer? That's a great question. Um, and then really opens up to the, the supplier in sharing with you, making the invisible visible, the real challenges um, that they are facing. And now you could be in a conversation around possibilities. How might we change that? Or what solutions are they um, are there? Or some suppliers have found a solution. Would you be interested in knowing what that was? So you're in a really different kind of a conversation then. Here's another one that was shared with me. My friendly relationship with the supplier, you know, we have this good rapport. It gets in the way sometimes of my asking tough questions. Um, and the positive opposite, my friendly relationship with suppliers makes it easier to ask tough questions or it doesn't get in the way. What, what's the outcome you're looking for? from this? How might you frame this conversation? What, what kind of a relationship would you really like to have? This one's friendly. What kind of a conversation would generate um, both friendly and able to deal with tough conversations? How would you describe that relationship? Any ideas? Polite as opposed to friendly, open and vulnerable. Yeah, if we have a, if we have a relationship that is more open and vulnerable, mutually trusting, where you feel supported to ask questions. Um, right. So it's safe for suppliers to be honest so we can work together. And a question uh, that might relate to that is, I've been looking more deeply into responsible sourcing. I want to learn more. Do you mind sharing how you go about your sources? Great question. So if the, if the frame is, I make it safe for my suppliers to be honest so we can work together on sustainability. I make it safe for them to be open and vulnerable. What questions might you ask to widen the screen? to make the invisible visible, to create shared understanding? How do you make it safe? So they're above the line when you ask a tough conversation or a tough question. What would make it safe for you to be open and vulnerable? I love the frame of we're not only friendly, but open and, vul and vulnerable. I'd be curious to know the challenges. Um, they don't have, yeah. So asking that question, what are the challenges that you have? Can you help me understand more about sourcing and the challenges to overcome and making sources, sourcing more responsible? Do you find supplying ethical traceable gems to be difficult? It's understandable, how can I help? Can you tell me about what, what's not going well on the mining sites or in the community? 
um, and what's going well. So what's going well, what's not going well, and how can we as an industry or we as a sector support what's not going well? How do we come together as a whole sector or a whole industry? These are great questions, perfect questions for this. Here's another one that um, was sent to me. Um, my caster hasn't heard of fair-minded gold and seems dismissive and inconvenienced by my request. So again, tuning into where, where that takes you. Get curious. Um, if my caster was open and interested in fair-minded gold, what would be the outcome? What, what kind of a conversation might we be in? What might be the frame if my caster was open and interested in fair-minded gold? Um, <laughs> calling in and information sharing, would you be open to using? So again, you're asking questions before coming with a frame, but there's a frame when you say, would you be open to fair-minded gold and under what conditions to frame it as my caster is open to using fair-minded gold perhaps under certain conditions. Um, uh, so we help each other learn and grow in our awareness of options and issues, but I really like my casters open um, to using fair-minded gold. Uh, great question of this, if I supply my own metal, would you use it for castings? Um, do you know suppliers that offer fair-minded gold? Um, there are so many jewelers who would flock to do business with you if you carried fair-minded gold. What a great conversation started, uh, starter. That might even be your frame to say this is such, um, it's such a high demand area. And there are so many people just like you who that haven't even heard of this yet. Are you interested? Because I think if you were to go into this business, so many jewelers would flock to you. What a great conversation starter, right? They're gonna be more interested and then you can begin asking questions. Um, what if I could find you other jewelry designers, right? That would, and, and I'll be happy to send them to you. <laughs> um, I'd love for us to introduce this together. So perhaps we could lead the way in our area. Another great relational way of engaging with this. Um, I'm more moving towards fair-minded and I really wanna keep working with you. Can we talk about how that might work? Wonderful question, that's so much above the line. Um, uh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> These are great, great questions. Um, one more, and I, don't, I think I've got one or two more and then we're gonna open this up to uh, other ones that you might have. A gem dealer accepts the word of a giant mining company that claims they're ethical when in fact the mining company is problematic. So again, tune in, flip it. Gem dealer doesn't accept the word or mining companies are actually honest. If those two were, the, were true, what might be the outcome? What is it that I really wanna talk about? What's the frame for my conversation? What might be the frame? Remember, a frame is not a question. It's a, it's a desired outcome that's not true yet. Um, it's what you want to talk about and move towards in your conversation. And one that will build relationship. And in, invite the other person, invite the supplier in. The gem dealer asks for more proof as well, um, we, can do, we can do so together. Um, how can they accept, how can they change their wording and accept new sources? Transparency of larger miners. These are all really close to creating a, um, a frame. Uh, and you, you might not get there, but they're all kind of looking around this whole thing of how do we get more transparency? Um, and that might be the conversation. How do we move towards that? How do we support one another in, in transparency? 
What are the happy communities saying about the miners? Great question. Clear definitions of ethical um, that are understood by all. <clears throat> so the question, what information has the mining company provided you that supports your claim? And I haven't been able to find the answer to. Yeah, so that's, it, it's asking, it's not telling the other person they're wrong. It's just asking for the data, asking for the information. Could you point me towards an article or a source about their ethics? Great. All right, so suppose we, in, we frame this conversation is that I'm gonna be in a conversation with this supplier about generating ideas that will support transparency and accountability. What are some questions you might ask that would widen the screen, that would make the invisible visible, create shared understanding or generate new knowledge and possibilities. What questions might you ask that a supplier might be really interested in talking about? What are you most proud of in the, in the way you do business? And you, you might wanna be even a little more specific. What are you most proud of when it comes to transparency and accountability? Um, because if you ask, if, you're, if you don't be really specific, you could be off on a different topic, which would be okay. But if you're wanting to talk about sustainability and or transparency and accountability, always um, direct the conversation toward that. Um, what would you like your relationship with your suppliers to look like? How does the mining company communicate their standards and practices to you? Yeah, so these begin to make the invisible visible. What's currently known? Um, and sometimes it's just a straight up, um, you know, what ideas do you, do you have that would support transparency and accountability for, for miners. What might get in the way? Who are the heroes of sustainability in your company that you'd like me to speak with? What a great question, right? That's so above the line. Great question, Christina. might even ask questions to the supplier like if you if you could um if you had the kind of data or evidence um, of transparency and accountability how might it positively impact your ability um, to to sell uh, what might be the the positive benefits of that and how can we make that happen Who's already doing that? Who's already really transparent and accountable? How did they get there? What kind of strategies do they, they use? What kind of um, structures or policies have they put in place that help make their efforts transparent and accountable? We don't have to reinvent, we can copy shamelessly. Okay, so, um, Let's, um, I just want to let you know that on our website, you can get a free conversation toolkit. Um, we offer boot camps in this, um, training in it, um, and you can also download the preface and introduction to the book on our website as well. Um, and I think now, Christina, did you want to do a drawing for a free book? Yeah, we have an exciting, let's check in with Anna. Are we ready? Yes, I believe I'm all set. I've been collecting everyone's names as we're here. So um, you might have seen on uh, Sherry's screen, we, we will have two books available. We're going to do one right now um, and one we're going to make available um, as we do our takeaway posts so that 
you know, if you have any friends who weren't able to join and they're interested in it, you can then let them know there will be another opportunity for it. So uh, let me do, I'm gonna do a, a fun little wheel of names, <laughs> share and we'll see who wins the one right now. Oh, how okay, fun. hopefully they're still here. I think a couple people had to drop off, but we'll just draw again if we need to. Oh, so close, Christina Mal. <laughs> okay. <Yay. laughs> wow. So Christina won't connect with you, and <laughs> yeah, Brandy, you were right on the line there. <laughs> but we'll connect with you, and we'll get a book over to you. Good thing it was decided by a computer algorithm and not our eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. So um, we, uh, there's so much chatting going on. I have a cat jumping around. Um, uh, we were hoping now to continue this conversation in a way, you know, we, Sherry, you did a great job incorporating the stories that people shared with us. Um, it was so fluid and nice to see. I hope some of you on the call recognized uh, some of the things that you submitted to us in that, in that exchange. So it was really excellent. Um, but we have an opportunity to dig a little deeper uh, too. So, um, Oh gosh, I'm reading the COVID notes here. I'm sorry. Um, everyone that's had it, is having it, might have it, knows someone that had it, dealt with it, et cetera. Along the way, there were all untouched. And I'm I'm sorry to read that. Yeah, feel better soon. Um, so um, Sherry, why don't we just, I'm gonna launch it to you for a minute. Um, you've, you saw, um, kind of the jewelry industry struggling a, a little bit to get started on, you had, you know, a room full of people from all points along the supply chain, um, working together. And at the end of, you know, you did one in New York, you did one in Tucson, you built takeaways around it. What? What were you seeing that we we could all be doing a little bit better, you know, and a lot of it stems from these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would say that um, it's it's so easy to get um, into your own kind of silo or your own space of what I need um, and what do I what I have to deal with. And I just need this from you. <laughs> Um, like, which again is really transactional. And what happened at those two summits is that that stopped and instead there was a lot of conversation across all different sectors um, of how do we support one another in getting what we need and everybody getting what they need in more responsible and um, sustainable ways. Um, and the kind of the, the edges um, of trying to protect fell away. And I, I know the, um, the distinct, there was a huge distinction in that between um, New York and Arizona um, in that the fears that some people felt um, might happen in the first summit, so they didn't come, came to the second one because they realized this is not about you know, making anybody do anything. It's, it's about us having conversations to, to move towards what we all want more of. Um, and, and for people to be able to stay in business and be profitable. Nobody's trying to drum, drive anybody out of business. So I think having that in the background and, and keeping that, um, it's the conversations that are about win, win, win across the whole industry. Thanks. Um, it is, it's really hard in this work um, 
as people are even noting, you know, in the questions that they're being sub that they're submitting, it's um, kind of getting to the truth, uh, getting to to the heart of the information. When we are, I mean, our our expectations for uh, larger companies are what they are. Um, in a way because they have the means and the resources and therefore we have the expectation that they would be able to deliver the information that we desire. And then, you know, we have Christina Viegas on the call who works with artisanal mining communities on a regular basis. And that is a different kind of um, conversation and a different way of bringing the truth right to the consumer or to the jeweler. And, um, uh, in all of this kind of striking the right balance between uh, an expectation for a certain set of um, data points versus an expectation of a share your story. So we're all kind of working on um, adapting uh, the tools that we use to ask our suppliers questions based on the specific context that supplier operates in. Yep. So yeah. that's what um, one of the things I'm so excited about how the, the direction that this conversation is going today is that um, we have some tools already just in this short time for how you can adapt um, based on who you're doing business with. So um, we still have a lot of folks on the call. Who has a question? Oh, good. We just got one. That um, Excellent. So let's read it. Or Anna, maybe you could do this if you want to. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Jared is asking, um, as someone white male and adult, like this is Jared, of course, speaking <laughs> with a societally gifted power, how do we solve or attempt to for the gender and skin color based interpersonal power dynamics that play into supplier conversations? Mm. When I was on the jeweler side of the business, the experience of then fellow designers, jewelers who are women, and especially women of color um, was quite different than mine, even with the same vendors at Tucson, for example, be it simply being acknowledged when approaching a booth to what prices they were quoted, mm -hmm. which were higher, et cetera. Wow, what a great conversation to start. Um, and, uh, and I love that it is a white male adult who has raised this point. Um, you're probably in the position, more of a position, all the men on this call are in more of a position to make um, a significant, uh, to start a significant conversation um, uh, that could make a difference. I think, I think women, women of color, men of color, anybody can make a difference in a conversation, but I think this is one of those places where men stepping up to be allies and starting that conversation is really important. Um, and again, it's a matter of what's, what is the frame that I want? Um, and, and so let's play with that for just a minute. What, what's the outcome? Imagine you're having a conversation with a supplier that you know kind of dismisses women or people of color and charges them more money for a gem. Um, what's the outcome of the conversation that you have with that person? Imagine you have a great above the line conversation and the outcome you're looking for happens. What's that outcome? Fairness, appreciation. for them to change their ways, right? So imagine having a, um, a, a frame for the conversation that, that says suppliers have a, are, have a growing appreciation for the importance of fairness in their dealings with um, all members of the jewelry industry. Um, and they're willing to change their ways. So imagine that's the frame for this. Um, suppliers treat everyone with real respect. That's kind of part of this whole thing. What generative questions might you ask to make the invisible visible?
what questions might, and, and keep in mind where you are when you're asking the question, whether you're above or below the line, because if you're below the line, that is going to come through either in your tone of voice or in the tenor of your voice or the expression on your face. You've got to be, you got to get yourself to a place where you're genuinely curious. Well, that's an interesting question. If I were a man, what price would you give me? <laughs> um, you're in a, if you're wanting to have a conversation that broadens the, broadens the screen for that supplier, that brings them to a place of, at least considering the ethics of their selling. The future of this industry is female. How are you supporting this reality in your business? Great question. Really great question. You might ask a question that says, tell me, tell me about how you price, how you decide to price your gems. How do you decide to price your product? What goes into that? Um, and is, do you, is there transparency behind it as we move towards um, transparency, sustainability, responsibility? Talk about our business as an ally, yes. How can we be an ally to the many, many women um, and people of color that are in this industry? So I'm not sure you're aware, but did you know that women are not only the customer base of the industry, but also are making up a larger and larger portion of jewelry designers? That's a lot of business that you might be missing out on. Most jewelry is either purchased for or purchased by women. It's women who are in the driver's seat as to whether we are successful in the business. We are, we really all should be treated differently. The same, right? We should all be treated the same. So be thinking about um, what are the questions, especially if you make, uh, if you make these statements, um, that Sharon and Brandy have made, how can you follow that up with a question? Um, uh, you might even begin talking about um, how can we as an industry uh, begin, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Raising up or making public those suppliers who are transparent and um, uh, equitable in their sale of their product. Though they will be noted, those will be on the top high list. Would you like to be one of those? You know, if you're not on that list, you know you're being called out. Um, would you like to be on the list? And would you like to help us work and figure out how um, you know, what is, what's the criteria for people being able to be on that list? You know, invite them to be the good guy, even if they're not right now. Um, and then it's some sort of a payoff or a re reward for changing behavior. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting that the... Um, Jalna, your your, uh, your comment of just being dismissed, it's, it is, it's almost even curious, um, given the fact that um, women's purchasing power these days is quite significant, especially women in business. Um, uh, and maybe even having some of those figures to show people, you know, are you aware that? Here's the purchasing power of the people you're ignoring and you're charging more money. Um, yes, it is. It's one, and once you've been put, once you've been ignored or kind of dismissed, it is hard to get back above the line. And so taking the time to pause, breathe and get really curious, um, not only about where you are, um, what's going on that you're buying into, 
uh, that, but what questions could you ask? And whether or not you could um, find an ally that this, if you really want this supply, you really want to purchase from this supplier, find an ally to go with you, a, a white male, um, walk up and have the white male ask the questions. And then you are the one that pulls out the, the, uh, the money and pays for the gem. Um, and you do that often enough and people are gonna start to um, say, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, yeah, same as buying a car. Um, and it is hard to not get a bitter feeling. And if, if we want to change things, it's, it is, um, if we try fighting it, we're just going to keep it where it is. It's that, um, moving into that space of, uh, instead of resisting and fighting against the people that are doing what they're doing, let's go find the people that are doing what we want everybody to be doing. And let's focus our attention there. Let's find out how, how is it that they are, what are they doing that makes their sale transparent? What are they doing that, um, who are they, that they are treating women and people of color um, the same as they are um, white males? And um, let's write articles about them. Let's, let's share their names. Let's spread that information. Let's build this groundswell of, of you know, if you want to get on the list of equitable suppliers, here's the criteria. Um, you know, sometimes talking to the person is really valuable. And sometimes going and creating what you want and inviting them to come along um, uh, can speak loudly. Yes, yeah, sometimes you don't have a white male ally. Um, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> um, I yeah, think Sherry, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Christina. I was just gonna add in with some of the things going on in the chat, but I think that's where you're headed to. Yeah, well, we might have done it, done it a different way. So if you don't hear uh, what you were thinking, please pipe in afterwards. Yeah. But in all of this work, you know, outcomes of the summit, uh, the development of ethical metalsmiths, the whole idea of the jewelry industry summit, the all the you know amazing initiatives that people are undertaking to bring responsibly sourced tr with transparent information gemstones to market. Like there's so much effort. Um, but this might be this particular issue. Um, that's showing up now, this kind of real disenfranchisement of people um, intentionally showing up at a show, paying money to go somewhere, wanting to buy and then not being treated fairly. That is, that's one I haven't seen a set of tools around yet. Um, it hasn't been developed yet. So that puts me in a how might we space, a creative space of how might we create a set of tools that um, help navigate those conversations um, in real time. It's, it's more I'm flagging that as an idea that we might come back to um, as a collective community. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, um, I was just gonna add that kind of echoing what's going on in the chat and um, appreciating Jared for bringing this up because that is, um, as white people, as white males, as anyone who is in a more privileged position, it is definitely um, up to us to take the initiative to move things like this forward. Um, you know, I'm seeing uh, Alix saying we don't want to need a white male. <laughs> yes, we don't, right? Um, and it's very understandable that these microaggressions are very exhausting. Um, so as much as we can be active allies, that is the really important part here. Great. It looks Amy, like did you have your hand up that you wanted to say something? No? Okay. No, I just wanted to 
um, affirm that. I appreciate what Jared said. That was powerful. And I, I appreciate that this conversation is getting started. But even now, and I, I started looking at the chat and it's touching us. And even, I'll say this, even saying women, we need to say women, women of color, it still separates. It's still a microaggression in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna put that out there because that's what I'm feeling right now. And when Alexander said that, it just hit home. That's why I signified for it because that's exactly it. We don't, why is it on us to have to make that happen when we're not the ones, women, women of color that created the situation? It's tiring. It's very tiring. That's all I have to say. Yes, totally agree. Amy, thanks for speaking up. Yeah. It's not easy to say. Um, it's totally our responsibility to hear and honor and work on. And thank you very much for bringing it up. Thank you for giving voice, being the, the, the platform for voice. And I'm just at the place I wouldn't have, maybe even a couple of months ago, but I'm at that place in life. I'm at that place in my art and business. And I'm, we're all, people, younger people, older people are looking at us. And we're in a place and a position where when we don't speak, we just keep it going. And it's not even, and it's not even the talking about it. What are we going to do? Or what are you going to do, really? Because, because the talk has been happening. I'm almost 60. And the talk has been happening before I was born. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? What are the actionable steps right here and right now? So, And, and that's the conversation to be in. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's acting every time you are able to counter a microaggression. It's, it's acting in that moment and it's actively uh, participating in conversations. Not just that, but participating in conversations that lead other people to action with you. And, right? and that is why, and I'll just say this one and I'll stop. That is why I, I love these, the, and I hadn't, I, I haven't been able to participate in a lot of the, um, the, the, the chats before, but it was important to be here because I see that people are open and, and I, I love and appreciate everyone here for that. But, but so often people feel really good about having these conversations and it's like, oh, gee, that's so bad, that's so horrible. I recognize that here. What are the actionable steps? This is, Sherry, this is wonderful. I've been taking notes, this is wonderful. And I'm in a group where we always bring things back. Um, Tanya is in the group as well. We always bring this information back. And the question always is, okay, so now they hear, now they know. And we sit and wait because it's again, not on us, not on women of color, not on women, but I'm talking, I'm, I'm very specific right now about women of color, too tired. Yeah. yeah. So we are looking at you. Yes. <laughs> we're, yes. All, we're watching. <laughs> so definitely, I mean, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, I see Bob has a hand raised, so I'm gonna I'm gonna a call on you, Bob. So it's 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 not it's not women of color's job to have to deal with this. It's I'm a, as a retailer. From my perspective, it's my job to, to deal with it. It's my job to seek out, it's our job, in my case, my wife and mine, to seek out des designers of color in this particular instance who are women and, 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 and ask to see their work and talk to them on the phone and, and, and work to add them to our collections. Um, um, it's not your responsibility, it's my responsibility to do it. And it's also my responsibility that when we encounter, if, if I'm standing at a show, we're going to be going to New York now, right? If we're standing at a New York now sh at, a, at a booth waiting to talk to a supplier and we hear something like that happen, 
to somebody else, be them of color or a woman or whatever, when it's our time to work with that individual, we need to make it clear to the uh, vendor that that's unacceptable and then let them know that we aren't going to do business with them. There have to be consequences for people to treat you that way. Um, and it's far and it's far past it's far past time that we don't stand up. We don't stand up and do something about it as well. Yes, definitely, Bob. Um, that's actually echoing something Tanya just dropped in the chat. Bear in mind that the actionable steps may have to include our white counterparts choosing to do choosing to stop doing business with a particular vendor. Yes, we have to show that there are consequences and that we are willing to make those changes. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I, wanna, I wanna add to, um, uh, so many of you know our consulting work in the context of these living room sessions, um, but the, the work in practice um, in, uh, helping businesses, one of the key things that we do is try to really hear what the company cares about and encourage them to care about certain topics when we don't hear them coming up or being mentioned. And then developing the questions that uh, ensure that at least they've gotten their message out about their values to, in, to Sherry's mm -hmm. kind of framing um, reality. We try to help them get their frame that they wanna be participating, that they wanna be engaging the industry on, the way they wanna be doing business. We work to get, to get alignment between the values that the people have and then the, making sure that the questions they have are in alignment. Where our systems fall short in the moment is exactly what Amy is saying. Um, and I, those of you, you know who you are on this call if we've worked with you on some of those, you know, the development of some of those questions. But I think as we start to come up with like an action we can take right now that I'm feeling really compelled to do, thank you, Amy, is to say like, let's, Let's look at the way we um, address this particular issue as a mandatory criteria in the you know, codes of ethics or the codes of conduct that we expect from the people we're doing business with, and then show how they're really practical, you know, how the question can be made really practical um, in asking. I know that's something that we can do. That's something that our business can do is to make sure that that lens, every time we do a job for somebody, that that lens is always part of the thing. We welcome help in that process because, you know, right now it's, you know, Cecilia and Anna and I, we have our own experiences. We don't have your experiences. So we, you know, appreciate learning the stories, but we can do that right now. Um, do a better job incorporating, um, hard questions, um, but hard questions that first identify the frame within which we would like to be operating, you know, the, the ideal scenario. Okay, we are at four minutes left um, in the program. Uh, we ended on a really powerful note. Um, and Sherry, if there are any kind of closing parting words of wisdom from your years of experience, having heard where this conversation landed at the end, um, we'd love to hear it, not to put you on the spot. No, I actually just typed it in. It's like that, that was and it is a conversation worth having. It's, it's one of the most important conversations worth having at this time in our it's been going on for a long time, but it's it's time for it to move for action and change to actually occur um, and people be willing to. So, um, yeah, I, and it, it, it occurs to me also that um, you're in an industry that touches so many lives around the world and the potential to create um, a positive movement of well-being and health for people around the world is phenomenal and 
just don't forget the power you all have. Your, your industry is, um, as a global industry, is, is significant. Thank you. So as a final reminder, we'll do another drawing um, via an Instagram story in a couple of weeks when we share takeaways from this. Um, based on where this conversation landed, you know, in the last quarter of it, um, when we do our takeaways, I would, I would love to be able to circulate them a little bit in advance with some of the people who have been on this call to make sure what we're putting out there as recommendations um, meet the, um, the weight of the need and um, so that we can all use the takeaways from this conversation as tools going forward. So if we reach out to you for a little feedback um, before we publish those, I hope um, you'll be open to sharing that because we are in a moment, because we're all in this conversation together that we could make the takeaways from this particular living room session really powerful. So wishing you um, a, for all of you going to Tucson, um, some folks are sharing that they're gonna be there if you wanna be in touch with each other. Buddy up if you're going shopping um, for stones and you wanna make sure that you can have the conversations that you wanna have, go with a buddy. Um, not specifying gender or anything like that, just take someone else with you so that you can be just good. Yeah, good reminders of what we're practicing. We can help remind each other, okay, yeah. where are you? Are you above? <laughs> yeah, and we'll see you on February 18th. Um, in light of this conversation, we might, we've had an idea, but I'm wondering if we might change our idea a little bit to continue um, some of the things we talked about today. So we'll be back in a month. Thank you all so Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Have a great show, everybody who's going next week. Thank Sherry, you. thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to press the button. Bye. Bye. <laughs>